Hello. Um, first of all, sorry about the number of slides in this video, but it's just another one of those topics where, you know, constant visual, you know, visual aids are helpful. And I'm also sorry about how scripted this video is probably going to end up sounding, um, just because it's a step-by-step -step explanation, and it, it really, I didn't want to miss anything, so I've just, I've just kind of written a vague script for it. But this is based on a comment that I get quite a lot, which is a very understandable comment um, from the perspective of someone who who hasn't read a lot about linguistics, which a lot of people haven't, because it's not, you know, it's it's quite a an out of the way field. Um, and that comment is about how can we possibly know how older versions of English sounded and how people pronounce things? How, how can we possibly know how people pronounce things in the 1500s or the 1400s if we don't have audio recordings from back then? And it. it it's sort of, I get the impression that sort of understandably people think the only way you could possibly do that is just through speculation, through reading things and, and, and kind of guessing how they're pronounced based on the spellings and maybe that rhyming evidence factors into that a little bit. But this is actually something people have been working on for a very long time, for decades, um, in fact more than a century, on the pronunciation of previous stages of English and previous um, well, historical languages like classical Latin and things like that. So in this video I just wanted to go through um, an example of an early modern English um, bit of phonology and how we can reconstruct that. So this, is, this has been done for pretty much the whole of early modern English phonology but of course I can't fit that into one video. Um, I'd like to go through things like Old English and maybe even Proto-Germanic in future videos, but for the time being um, this will just focus on an aspect of early modern English phonology, um, just so that I can link people. I, you know, at some point I might write a longer thing about this so I can send it to people if they, uh, if they ask this question, but for the time being it's just good to have something to link people to. So that's what I'm going to do in this video. The first thing to understand is that pronunciation is not the abstract thing that a lot of people take it to be. So when two people speak with different accents, that's not some mystical kind of veneer that gets laid over their voices. It's because on a mechanical level, these people are pronouncing things differently. Um, their vocal tract is doing a different series of movements. So if I say great, and someone from Liverpool says great, the difference between those is measurable. The second thing to understand is that sound change works really systematically and we have a good understanding of the patterns of sound change because we've been studying it in modern languages for decades. It's not just random things that happen to one word and not other words. You know, it's, it's systematic patterns of change that apply very regularly. For our example in this video, we'll take the vowels in the words face and goat as they were in London in about 1700. And I've chosen this example because it's different from the modern London pronunciations of these vowels, but because it's so recent, we can quite confidently say what the vowel qualities would have been like. Um, and there's a lot of variety in modern London accents, but nowadays you might hear something like face, goat, or maybe face, goat, depending on the age of the speaker. These are called raising diphthongs, these A, O, because the quality of the vowel changes as you say them, so it's a diphthong, and that change is because the tongue is getting higher in the mouth, so it's a raising diphthong. A, O. You might be able to feel that in your tongue. A, O. It gets higher in the mouth. And in the goat diphthong, for a lot of London speakers, it starts off unrounded with the lips unrounded, and they become rounded as the diphthong goes along. So, O, O. You can sort of feel that. See, see me doing it. O, O. So that's how things are pronounced now. Our most direct evidence that this wasn't the case 300 years ago comes from descriptions from the time. Um, lots of grammarians around then were writing about English pronunciation in a fairly technical way, some more so than others. So Robert Robinson, who was writing in 1617, even came up with his own phonetic alphabet to write English, and he made it completely different from the Latin alphabet we normally use, just so that English spelling didn't cloud his judgement of how things were pronounced. He clearly understands the difference between a monothong, e, and a diphthong, a, and he puts the face and goat vowels as long monothongs, vowels where your tongue and lips stay in the same place the whole time you're pronouncing them. So not a, o. Other grammarians from nearer 1700 agree with him there. And you could easily and, and reasonably say this is just us putting our faith in a few grammarians who might not know what they're talking about, but there are a lot of other lines of evidence as well. We know that in modern languages, dialect features often spread out from centres of influence. 
This is happening all over the world as we speak, including in Britain, and it's happened while audio recording has been a thing. Rural areas often end up catching dialect features after they start being used in urban centres, and that explains a lot of things. So, for example, it explains why rural dialects from Norfolk, Hampshire and the West Country have noticeable similarities, even though these places are miles apart, and why London in the middle sounds so different from all of them. These places have conserved some features of older Southern English speech, while London and its immediate surroundings innovate new features. And of course, these rural dialects are evolving their own new features as well. But if rural dialects over a really broad geographic area have something in common, that thing might be an older feature of a prestige dialect from a big city in the middle. If we look at southern dialect speakers who were born in the late 1800s, we find that loads of them have monothongs for the face and goat vowels. The ones that don't tend to come from quite near London. And these monothongs normally have qualities something like fierce goat, or sometimes the slightly lower fierce goat. We call it sheep and we call it ponies. And the sheep was the native breed. These qualities tend to mirror each other. The face vowel is at the front of the mouth, with the tongue towards the front of the mouth, and the goat vowel is at the back. But the tongue is at the same height for both of them, and that's a really, really strong pattern in modern languages, front-back symmetry in vowel inventories. No matter whether it's English or another language, that's a very strong pattern. These vowels are roughly mid-height in all the dialects where they're monothongs, so they're not the highest vowels, they're not the lowest vowels, they're mid-height. And they also start off mid-height in the dialects where they're diphthongs. And in fact, these vowels are mid-height almost everywhere in Britain. So you might hear a northern speaker saying or, e, which are monothongs, which are, again, mid-height. So we would reconstruct these as monothongs, vowels where the tongue stays still while you're pronouncing them. We'd reconstruct them as m roughly mid-height, so the tongue is roughly halfway up the vowel space. And we'd say the face vowel was probably at the front of the mouth and the goat vowel was probably at the back. So the face vowel is probably something like face or face, and the goat vowel is probably pronounced something like goat or goat. Let's look at some alternative possibilities to see if they make sense. What if we're wrong about these vowels being mid-height? Is it possible that they're actually high vowels, face, goat? Well, there are already two vowels in roughly these positions, the fleece vowel and the goose vowel, fleece goose, and all evidence points to them being in roughly these positions 300 years ago, possibly even more monothongal, so fleece goose. So if you want to suggest that the face and goat vowels are high, you'd be suggesting one of two things. Either all these vowels were high, face had the same vowel as fleece, and goat had the same vowel as goose, so fleece, fleece, goot, goose or you're suggesting that the fleece and goose vowels were not in these positions and that that reconstruction is wrong and these vowel qualities were actually something else, leaving space for the face and goat vowels to be in these e u positions, fleece, goot. Let's go through both of these, starting with the idea of a merger. Vowels do sometimes merge with each other and you can see that in the cot, court merger in some US dialects. But once they're merged, they can't unmerge along the same lines. A vowel can split into two separate vowels under a conditioned sound change. For example, a hypothetical one might be E becomes E after a nasal consonant or something like that. But in those cases, you can usually tell that's happened because there's a condition in place that governs where you have E and where you have E. You can tell based on the surrounding sounds where the split happened, if you see what I mean. You can tell that it's happened after nasal consonants. And in the situation we're talking about here, with face and fleece, goose and goat, there doesn't seem to have been a conditioned split between the face and fleece vowels or between the goose and goat vowels. So here it's clear that fleece and face always had separate vowels and goose and goat always had separate vowels as well. In other words, this hypothetical situation with fleece, fleece, goose, goat is impossible because that would mean there were vowel mergers that clearly haven't happened in mainstream Southern English and in actually no dialect I'm aware of, although I'm always reluctant to say that because often there turns out to be some little exception somewhere. Our other alternative was maybe fleece and goose didn't occupy the e u positions. Maybe back then they took different vowels. Well, again, this is in direct opposition to what writers at the time were telling us, and they often use the vowels of other European languages to make clear what the sound is supposed to be. Obviously, this isn't a perfect reference for modern linguists because other European languages might have changed their pronunciation as well. We know these vowels weren't lower because in our hypothetical that would put them lower than the face and goat vowels, which would mean a few things. It would mean that they've since switched around in every single dialect of English, leaving no evidence at all in writing or, as far as I know, in rural dialects. And it would mean, again, that all of these grammarians were lying about the positions of these vowels.
That seems unlikely, so fleece and goose are reconstructed as e, u, and we assume that the face and goat vowels are lower than that. In that case, if they weren't high vowels, is it possible the face and goat vowels were low vowels? Fas, got. Well, that actually kind of lines up with how they're spelt, and this is a more complicated question. There's good evidence to suggest that the face vowel was actually something like a ah at some point in history. In the 1560s, a man called John Hart tried to introduce a new spelling system for English where each letter represented one sound, and he provides some really detailed phonetic descriptions of things like dental t and d, and also how voiceless plosives are aspirated at the start of a word like they are in most dialects of modern English. His descriptions deliberately try to be mechanical and describe the quality of the sounds disconnected from the spelling, which is how modern linguists try to do things. And he describes five basic vowel qualities. And he says these qualities can be either short or long, but within a short long pair, both of the vowels have the same sound, they have the same quality. And he has the vowel in words like trap and cat in a long short pair with the vowel in words like face and mate. We're fairly confident that the short trap vowel has stayed pretty stable throughout the history of English for reasons I'll put on screen now if you want to read through them. Uh, of course, there are a few slight differences in quality, but it's always a fairly low vowel and it's usually not a back vowel. And if face was in a long short pair with trap, this means it had the trap vowel just held for longer, something like fast. Robert Robinson, writing about 50 years later, was doing the same thing as Hart, trying to create a phonetic alphabet for English. And he also has the trap vowel in a long short pair with the face vowel, trap fast. Again, the spelling of the word reinforces this idea. In most European languages, the letter A represents something like A, ah, so the spelling of the word face then makes more sense why they would choose to spell it with an A, you know, in consistency with other European languages that have that as an A. Ah. So if it was fast in about 1600, then how can we be sure it wasn't fast in 1700? Well, we've got to remember language isn't a monolithic thing. So just as there are different versions of Southeastern English nowadays, there are also different versions in 1600 based on things like social class and exactly where you came from. As Roger Lass points out, some French books from about 1600 that describe English actually describe the trap and face vowels as having separate qualities. Trap had a vowel closer to the French a, ah, and face had a vowel closer to the French air, er, face. This doesn't tell us the exact quality, but it tells us that the face vowel was probably higher in the mouth than the trap vowel. So as Last says, this suggests that there were maybe two different versions of standard Southern English at the time. A more conservative version with trap fas, and a more innovative version with trap fes. But well before 1700, most grammarians were treating these as separate vowel qualities that were only connected by their spelling, suggesting that the face vowel had raised like the French sources and later English dialect recordings suggest it did. We don't have quite the same granular detail of evidence for the goat vowel, but people like Robert Robinson do suggest that in the early 1600s it had a higher quality than its short equivalent, the lot vowel. Lot, gort. And that's what we find in all the later dialect recordings as well. You might have noticed that throughout all this I've been assuming the vowel qualities were around the edges of the vowel space. There's all this space to move around in, but I've only been considering this area. Is it not possible that they were just more central, like first girt? Well, there's a really strong pattern throughout the world's languages whereby vowel qualities tend to be really spaced out around the vowel space. You never see a vowel inventory that looks like this. They tend to look more like this. Some languages do have central vowels, and English is one of them, but peripheral vowels are overwhelmingly more common, and the face and goat vowels are peripheral in all the later dialect recordings. Older grammarians sometimes describe known central vowels like uh as indistinct and they never make that kind of comment about the face and goat vowels. So this all points to them being quite peripheral. That doesn't mean they definitely weren't central, because some Yorkshire dialects have fairly central pronunciations of the goat vowel nowadays, like gur. I'm trying, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do it very well, but people from Yorkshire will know what I mean. So it's clearly possible to have a central realisation, but in this case it's very unlikely for the reasons on the screen. So far I've been assuming these vowels were monophthongs, Face, goat. Is it possible they were narrow diphthongs? Face, goat. To check you can hear the difference. Face, 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 goat, 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 goat. Well, monophthongal versions are really widely attested in the Alton survey, and grammarians in the 1700s could tell the difference between monophthongs and diphthongs, and they consistently lump the face and goat vowels in with the monophthongs. That doesn't necessarily mean they weren't diphthongs for some speakers, but it tells us that monophthongs were considered standard for these words. 
it's completely possible that some dialects had narrow diphthongs at this stage in history and that it just didn't get recorded. But this is positive evidence that monophthongal versions did exist and were considered sort of standard or proper. So something like fierce, gaut, or maybe the slightly lower fierce, gaut. Just while we're here, I'll go through the consonants quickly. Three of them, f, s, and g, are pretty uncontroversially the same as they are in modern standard English. Cognates of these words in other languages tend to have the same sounds as we do in English, and these letters really consistently represent f, s, g across European languages, so there's no reason at all to think these were different back then. If you wanted to suggest that any of these were different in 1700, you'd have to explain this extremely strong pattern, not only across English, but across other European languages as well. If other sounds were standard in these words 300 years ago, you'd expect to see some evidence of that in English dialect or in cognate words in other languages, but you don't. Or do you? Well, in the case of the word face, there are some broad West Country dialects where face would be pronounced something like this. Maybe not today, but 50 years ago or so. I mean, maybe, maybe today some people do pronounce it like that. So this with a V at the start. Is it possible that it was this in London in 1700? Well, again, it might have been in some dialects, but almost certainly not in standard higher register dialects. The dialectal vers pronunciations exist because of a rule in some West Country dialects that means f, s, th become voiced v, z, th at the starts of words. And this is a very regular rule that's relegated to West Country dialect. If it appeared all around the south of England, we might interpret it as an older feature of London English, but as far as I know, it's a characteristically West Country feature, so it's probably appeared in the West Country. Originally, the sound in face was definitely f, so these are f, s, g. The t at the end of goat is a bit harder. The exact phonetic realisation of this could have been one of a few things. Other languages and modern dialects of English realise this sound in a few ways. It's almost always alveolar, or occasionally dental, t or t. It's almost always a plosive, and it's almost always voiceless. In modern standard English, it's a voiceless alveolar plosive, t, which is sometimes slightly affricated. In other words, the average pronunciation of this sound. Phonetic descriptions from the time are clear that this was the case 300 years ago as well. The only thing you could reasonably argue about is whether or not there was glottal reinforcement, and I suppose maybe whether it was affricated as well, was it t or was it t? Glottal reinforcement is a thing that happens in southeastern English nowadays, where a glottal stop is shoved in front of a voiceless plosive at the end of a word. So I don't say goat, goat. I say goat, goat. There's a glottal stop between O and T, which is sometimes a bit hard to hear, so I'll, I'll do it a few times. Goat, 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 goat. This is a really surface level phonetic feature, and I don't know of anyone that's tried to work out when it appeared in the southeast. Phonological changes often happen in regional dialects a really long time before they start spreading. And I, given how widespread it is nowadays, I personally think this probably did exist in some dialects in 1700. But whether it existed in standard high prestige dialects, I have no idea. It could have been gaut, it could have been gaut. I don't really know how you'd tell. So the final verdict, face or face, and gaut, 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 or gaut, one of those. If you had to pin me down to marginally more likely ones, I'd say fierce, gaut. And bear in mind, this isn't something I've just worked out myself. This, you know, this is something that people have been working on for, for many decades. So that's an example from a version of English where we have written phonetic descriptions. But what about versions of English where we don't have that? So Old English, the language of the Anglo-Saxons, for example. If we only have written texts and nobody from the time thought to tell us how they were pronouncing things, surely these letters could represent any sounds. As I say, I'll probably do one of these reference videos for Old English, um, possibly a slightly longer one, and also maybe one for Proto-Germanic as well. And if you've got any questions about either of those things that you want clarifying, then let me know in the comments and I'll try and get around to those in those videos. And if you want anything about this video clarifying or if you think I've missed anything about these vowels, then also put that in the comments and I'll try and clarify. Thank you very much indeed for watching and I will talk to you next time.